uh, you would have a, uh, a sort of free ranging conversations around various issues concerning the 1970s that Don and I have talked about for many, many, many years. Um, but at this point, we, we, we really only have about an hour, and clearly there are a number of latent issues in the room around the 1970s, and I, it, it seems to me that it might be more productive to let fly with much more of those things than to constrain the conversation around Don and myself. Nevertheless, Don did indicate to me that he has something to say. <laughs> so so um, let us begin with Don. There are a number of things that I would like to put up there like on the table, just as, as broad questions, certainly you not know, as propositions or as statements. So I will leave the propositional voice to Don. Well, thank you uh, very much. Thanks to everybody. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, I wanted to begin by talking uh, to uh, which is that in a period that one is discussing, the number of people who would be with a lot of things, and I think you should remember that Brian mentioned someone in Robinson. Thought, or very little thought, most people took 
the material, the personal ambitions and those things. I mean, obviously this does enter to some degree, but this was very much a secondary. And I think to me this is one of the most interesting ethical qualities of the period, which is uh, seldom commented on, and which are uh, one might be said more than I kind of like book actually. <laughs> 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 is that he doesn't grasp this at all. Or he, he, I wouldn't guess it, but he, he grasps it in a very limited degree. Uh, and, uh, and I understand why he doesn't grasp it, because it's very difficult to grasp it if you weren't there and experiencing this tremendous idealism. Which, of course, the people on the receiving end, I'm thinking of uh, King, then people on the receiving end of this idealism found it simply outrageous and offensive that people uh, would be uh, proposing and actually not proposing, but acting on that his beliefs uh, to uh, upturn the social order to which people being accustomed and to challenge the received wisdom of their experience. But this was a remarkable period. I cherish it greatly. Uh, I was very fortunate to live at that time, as, as um, what our words were said about the French Revolution, I suppose. Uh, and I wish it were possible to evoke this uh, in some way uh, to people because it's a distinctive feature of the theory. Can I sorry. Can we pause over this a moment that that I know you have much else to say, Don, but I but I, I think that there is much to to open up around what you call the ethic. I, I mean, I, 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 I would call it the ethos of the of the period. What Brian referred to as a, the audacity, yeah. or the the, 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 the the ability of people to be indignant yeah. at injustice, and not just to be indignant, but, but to act, act or in an in organized form and with uh, sacrifice uh, for what they perceived to be. The, the greater good. And one of the, obviously this doesn't characterize the present, but one of the things that seems to me important to try to think about, like going back to the, the discussion a while ago about pink, the town red, and the sense of an ending to this Frank idea of how fiction ends and what the significance of that is. Because it's not just that the 70s were defeated, and, and Brian qualifies that, I think, in, in important ways, but not just that we set a sense now that the 70s were in some sense defeated, but there is something deeply fundamental about the ethos and spirit of the 1970s that is drained. It was as though somebody pulled a stopper, and something of the ethos of that era was drained out of so that there is still the possibility to produce words that sound, that, that, that are, as it were, lexically the same kinds of words of the 1970s, but they are not um, animated by the sensibility, the mentality, the cultural force of the 1970s. And this doesn't seem to me to be simply explained by, you know, the collapse of the Green Revolution or the, um, the defeat of the People's National Party in 1980, there is something larger than these individual events that has to be thought about if we are to try to understand what, it, what, what, has, what was lost or what is absent in the present that existed in the era of the 1970s. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just want to interject because I think that James's novel is asking about the extent to which idealism was sufficient to shift people's material reality at that time. It raises a doubt. So when you talk about loss now in relation to then, it raises a doubt about them. And who is the who is the they yes, that absolutely. we're speaking for when we talk about idealism at that moment? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, I think there is a, a generational certainly, and perhaps indeed a class element to, to all of this. But there is, I mean, I think they, um, I am not. Sure, I think that Marlon James's novel is raising a question about how earlier generations were animated by the 1970s. 
And in, in the novel, I think Marlon sees things that an older generation didn't see, perhaps this is a Brand's point, could not have seen, and sees it from a place that an earlier generation did not and could not see. But that is not to say that he's right and the others were wrong, right? It's, so I think, it's, it, it's, I think it really is important to try to ask um, about the, way, the ways in which losses and gains, if this is the language in which to speak, historiographical memory is composed, decomposed, recomposed, when and for what. And I think that's, to, to my mind anyway, the large question about the, that we are trying to grapple with here. Someone, um, um, in, in the exchange between Belinda and Honor, the question of memory, or, 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 or Kelly J raised the question of memory, and I think that's absolutely important. Obviously, we are here um, remembering, and I think part of the large conceptual work that we are trying to imagine is what kind of remembering and in some sense, Marlon, born in 1970, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Born in 1970. So there is a sense which I think, I, I think Don is right, that he, he can't be generationally animated by what the WPJ um, comrades were animated by. And I think that is part of what I mean by the draining out of a certain kind of sensibility um, from a uh, particular mm -hmm. moment. A couple of things, though. Um, I think um, this idealism, and I think it's a really important point, uh, was uh, uh, the foundation for political activism. In other words, it was not that people felt idealism would make the situation. Not far from it, in fact. This is the background of the this of the period. The idealism was, was one expression and foundation for for extremely aggressive political action, which had very serious consequences. So, so the idealism was there, uh, and not can take it in the way you want. But uh, this period, above all, was a period of, poli of political struggle, of the most acute and extreme form, including armed forms of struggle. Uh, so it went right to the brink here. And if, uh, this is one of the things uh, which is not understood, presented as a party struggle, PMP, JSC struggle, like, which is far from being the case, but very difficult to understand that from today's perspective when everything seems to be a matter of PMP versus JRP. This is not at all how it was at all, since in fact there was as intense a struggle against the PMP right within the PMP uh, as there was against the JRP right. And in many ways, actually, Michael in particular was quite cunning in his idea that he could pull over parts of the GLP, especially the share, and that way, to pull them over uh, to the, not the left, but certainly to some center thing. So uh, one of the problems, I think, with the current standpoint is that where things are defined in part in terms of it was really a fight between the PMP and the GLP, uh, very far from the truth. Uh, it was a political class for the other party of dire proportions in which one had to take hard decisions. Uh, I really want to stress this point. Uh, in other words, uh, one it's a sort of vivarian point, if you will, of, of um, politics of vocation. Uh, one, had, one had to act or be acted on. This was the choice. There's no room for but yes, but part of the reason for that, which is, I agree, part of the difference between then and now, yeah. is that in the 1970s, the presumed target or the presumed object of political work was the state. The state, the state, what, the state was the target of all political activity, right? And there's a sense on the left that what was up for grabs was how, in some way, not necessarily to wholeheartedly or fully capture the state, but influence the state in a particular way. Absolutely true. The core, I think the core, the core position on the left, and by the way, I include the PNP left on this, the YO, DK, and that group, and certainly the particular core 
at the core of opposition. We have one, I think, just dogmatic issue arising at least at the core of it. The core of it was the feeling that nothing would change, zero would change, it's part of the fact that energy is retired. Nothing would change by cultural measures. Nothing would change by social reform. Nothing would change. All of these things are important, but nothing would change unless you could change two things. You got to have different social classes controlling the state. And this was achieved in some degree, but not uh, in the end. It couldn't be the end of the year. You can win it, but can you keep it is a question. Uh, it turned out you couldn't. Uh, we couldn't, or we didn't. Uh, so the state was one question. Absolutely fundamental question on which we would not do any compromise. The groups which control the state, the post colonial elite, if you like, had to be removed. And a different set of social forces had to take control of the state. Or nothing to do with it. Neither sexuality, nor gender questions, nor race questions. Absolutely zinch progress without the number one. We had to break the back of the economy. Those are the two principles. If you, you could talk until the cows come home, if you didn't control the state, and if you control the state uh, and couldn't transform the economy, no problem. You're in deep trouble. This was the core, I think, of the materialism of the left, on both the PNP and the left and ourselves. And the question, of course, there are many debates as well. Who should control this? Who, who exactly should control this data? And also, what should be done on the economy? Right? And everything, I think, when you get through everything, all the things, I mean, a tremendous cultural activity, there are many musicians, I mean, I think of Sugar Minor, Danny Fitzroy, and many of them were very close to the WPJ, many of the WPJ are very, very close, and so on. Many people who are art and literature and so on are very close. Uh, people, uh, the WPJ was extremely influential in the professions. I maintain my silence, but I look around at our judiciary today <laughs> uh, at extremely high levels. Um, Again, I'm going to question. I'm going to question. Just one question for Medicine, I would say, was almost completely dominated by the way we had the Soviet Union made that law, likewise. Uh, education was state, uh, but the level of domination over this part of the society was simply enormous and immediate. Um, I mean, the, the question is, and I, I invite people to jump in yeah. here, because I, you know, I was a youth, of course, and hanging around with the WPJ, I was taught, of course, by the WPJ. But, this, but Lenin's State and Revolution was the Bible, in some sense. We all read and reread State and Revolution. It was the, quest, the question before um, we left was, as you say, the question of state power. But I, I wonder with the question of revolutionary violence emerged at a certain point in, um, in, in, in the discussions earlier today. And I remember talking to Bernard at length, Bernard Ford at length, about uh, the, what he calls, I don't know if he calls it in, in his memoir, because I haven't yet read it, but uh, the culture of violence in the side of revolutionary grenade and the sense in which people were expendable in the service of an assumption about A, the progress, and B, in terms of who needed to be removed for the state to occupy. So, I mean, the question of violence and the state here, I think, is, is, is something that, um, you know, should be a conversation that we have. Rich, you gone? I have to go away. Right. Thank you so much, guys. Right. No, I, I just wanted to come in, come in there because I, I think that Jamaica in 19, say 1972, 73, um, PNB of course come to power. There is already an established geometry of violence, yeah. which, is, which, is, which is already entrenched, right? I've written about this elsewhere, in 1970, Three, late 73, early 74, I just come back to Jamaica, and we had a meeting of the anti-imperialist front at Cookhorn Lane, which is where um, Ben Monroe had the Southwest St. Andrew Citizens Association. 
Um, and it was, I mean, it was every possible organization you can imagine. When a situation is approaching, a, a revolutionary situation, organizations just proliferate. And we had every trend. The only trend we didn't have was the Albanian. Trinidadians had the Albanian because they like to play mass. We didn't have an Albanian trend. But we had every possible more strength towards the different um, Trotsky strengths, uh, the so-called Marxist Lenin strength, the PNP UIO, and uh, the, the independent organizations like Ben and so So we're having a meeting. And I am young, so just come back from my undergraduate training, and I'm going to this meeting because we're discussing serious political things. So we reach the end of the lane, and there's a guy sitting down on the lane with what looks like a bicycle frame um, across his lap. But it is a, it is, it is a, a jerry-rigged buckshot called a bucky, right? Using the frame and um, buckshot to defend us. So I say, what are these independent us against? Because we come from a meeting, we're not come for war, you know? But, but in Southwest St. Andrew, they knew that if the JMP people knew that PNP writ large, no matter what, are holding a meeting, there is war. And, you know, he has his defense. And the, the you know, truth to form, the meeting was broken up because um, the JMP heard about it, came from up, from um, at the time, Portia seems to still, still didn't have full control, control of that end of, of, of St. Andrew, came for the meeting. And uh, it was the first time that I heard automatic weapon, weapon uh, in actual shooting, except on um, war films that I had seen before. This is 1972, right? Um, so there was already an established framework. And if you are going to hold meetings, if you're going to organize, you're going to have to defend yourself. Um, what saved us was that some of the PNP people ran Tony Smalley at the headquarters, and he and his men came, his security guards, and they raced the JLP people who had come to mash up the meeting out of there. That's why I'm probably here today to, to tell that particular story. Um, I think Tory Box was in that meeting too, representing an obscure um, trans cat, Neil James' is friend. Uh, very important uh, because somebody mentioned it in this meeting called the RML, the Revolutionary yeah, Nazi League. Yeah. I shouldn't say obscure, but it's um, okay. But, but it, it, um, I was told it's trained at the time. Yeah, the post a bang, that's the post a bang. You know, some people went there, some went in other direction. But I'm just making a simple point. Mm -hmm. that uh, violence was an established uh, cultural way to establish your position as legitimate, particularly in the inner cities of Kingston, um, as early as 1972. And um, you read on top of that um, some very specific moments, like Allende in Quebec, I, I use it in my poetry, was a very important philosophical, ideological touch point for the end. There were not going to be Allende's in the face of, um, of reaction. And therefore, what was the implication of that? That you were going to try to do what Allende was able to do, defend himself. Can I just make one point before I appreciate it? Basically, the situation that is, is that one is trying to change society with people as they are, not as we wish them to be. And these people, including ourselves, have all sorts of imperfections and tendencies. And the difficulty is precisely here that you have to deal with the people as they are in reality and, and find some way to go forward uh, in that very, very difficult situation. And so it's a tough thing. This is what I want to say, but it's just right. <laughs> it's what it's what it means. Um, you made me think of just now. Um, but I just wanted to go back to the state focus that you raised. 
um, David and uh, what Don was saying about the idea, the dominant idea at the time being that um, no one had to seize the power of the state in order to create the kinds of transformations that needed to be created in order to change society, etc. So to my mind, then, this is what the generational difference is, and I will use Marlon as a foil instead of continuing to harp on the questions I've been raising for the last two days. But, so I think, like, um, for, for Marlon, um, clearly the state uh, is not coherent, it's not located anywhere in that normal. Right? is not located anywhere really in a fixed kind of way and it's not the object of struggle. And that's the generational difference I think that creates, uh, I mean it creates his story in, a, in, in the very particular way that it creates his story, but it also then creates other kinds of, <laughs> you're so tall. <laughs> um, you know, other ways to envision political action that is not tethered to the seizure of the state. And, I, and so that's the hegemonic idea that I think has changed, right? And, and maybe it has changed because of, and I don't really want to use this word because I don't want to drive us into pessimism, but uh, the failure to seize the state, maybe that is what created um, the possibility of seeing politics through some other kind of lens, even as it was already happening, as Honor is showing us, yes. you know, with her talk, or or uh, as you were talking about with the Jamaican gay freedom movement, and, you know, like it is already happening on the ground, as as mass party politics are 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 envisioning yeah. political futures around the state. So, I think Marlon actually quite stages, uh, actually, and uh, in fact, idealizes a, a, a state which has gone away, and uh, the embodiment of this is the uh, guy with obviously Ken Jones, uh, who um, walks off the thing or is pushed, and, and this way of framing it is that uh, there used to be a state, right, which was capable and uh, good people such as this poor guy was pushed off his thing up, walk every seat, walk whatever it is. And this is of course an urban myth of a JLD. It's an entirely JLD urban myth. Uh, and his position, his political position is quite clear, right? But to me anyhow, that this is a position of somebody who's coming from within the anti siaga part of the JLD. This is his position, right? So it is bitterly critical of and ridicules Siaga. But from the point of view of a state which was pure before characters like Seattle got into the grave, right? So there was this guy who, had he but not been pushed off, had he not sleep walk off or whatever, and, 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 right? Uh, had he, had, that was a, that took him in a way, the structure of the novel is set up. This was a turning point. And so he had us after a state which had been lost. So it's, to me, it's not that he's pushing for a different kind of a, a non-state situation. But that he actually, deep down, idealizes a state, which actually is quite a repressive state, right? a very conservative state, and frames it that way. But that would be my one argument. Uh, the other thing is that the position that I would line about the state uh, was not that uh, there wasn't to be any on the other issue, not that they are, although we formulated it badly, and maybe we can and uh, as we put it, the woman question. Right? As we formulated it, it's wrong uh, again. We had nothing on sexuality at all, that was all the question of the right? Uh, but it, uh, culture, that, that sphere, broadly speaking, we just did that today. It was not that that sphere was not important. It, they, it was profoundly important and understood to be important. People like Barry and Slugger and all of many, many brands itself were extremely active and I think maybe not encouraged enough, but certainly uh, encouraged and valued. The point was that uh, that activity would go nowhere uh, unless it was underpinned by the control of the state. So that the foundation to make that work, and this is the view that I want to, it is not that that was unimportant, 
but that in the absence of a firm grip on the state by these social forces, this was not even a question. That gender, sexuality would even arise on the agenda, that it would be crushed and stifled, and the ethical and moral order of the old post-colonial and even the threat. The other thing I'll ask Nancy on this is that actually we did get the state. <laughs> the problem is that we didn't get, not that we didn't get control of the state, but we didn't keep it. This was the problem. Uh, the PNP left, certainly, uh, got control of our state, especially the detailed Ministry of Mobilization. We were thick in it, we all over the thing. Uh, there were deep, I mean, who small was Minister of Finance? I mean, the left was in control of the state.
in the middle of the 1970s, there would have been that real sense of the control of the state, in the, given the nature of the, of the, um, even with strategic, what is it called? Strategic support for the for the PNP. Critical support. Critical support for the for the PNP in the um, 1980 elections. There was obviously there were um, significant. Criticisms of the of the PNP. I'm, you know, I'm Don. I'm surprised by this renarrativization because to, just to take, you know, you say Hugh Small was Minister of Finance, but by the time Hugh Small becomes Minister of Finance, the, the, yeah, the, 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 the left is on the, is is collapsing, and the the um, the, 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 the project of 1970 that grows out of the 1976 elections is on its knees, it seems to me. But anyway, one of the questions that hasn't been, hasn't been raised here, but I think it, 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 the name has come up once in a while, Siaga. And I think that there is a, an, as important a story to be told about the support the right in Jamaica as there is to be told about the left. And how do we rethink the story of the Jamaican Labour Party? How do we rethink the rise of Edward Siaga um, and Siaga's ability to outmaneuver Hugh Shearer at that particular point. How does one re how does one think about that entire period from the from the death of of Sangster to the rise of Edward Siaga so in the nineteen forty? Exactly. What was his name? <laughs> that was, a J that was J J J JP JP um, um, Gates. It wasn't Ken Jones, but yeah. yes, it's your George's brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jones. So there, so there is a story here to be told about the recharacterization of the Jamaican Labour Party under Siaga, and the, and the both the question of the continuities and discontinuities between Siaga's Labour Party and and the, the older uh, Boston anti. The BITU Connective Party and the way in which that helps to shape the struggle in the 1970s, in, not on, on part of the left in the 1970s. And you know, this is, I think, something that Marlon tries to capture in, in, um, in a brief history. So that's one thing that I, you know, I think should be part of our. Of our so, yeah, I think we should also. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to ask you a completely different question. So, if you want to go first, that's fine. No, no, go ahead. Um, so, speaking as someone from a younger generation than Marlon James, um, if this has been covered yesterday or this morning, feel free to skip me. But it's really striking to me listening to both Don Robotham and Brian Meek speak about this particular generation that. This is how the Cubans talk about the 1960s. Sorry? That this is how the Cubans talk about the 1960s. Yeah. And to think of the Jamaican 70s as starting in 1968, from a lot of other perspectives, sounds like a paradox, right? Because in a lot of parts of the world, 1968 is an ending, right? And not just France, in, in Mexico, or in Czechoslovakia. Um, in Cuba, people would normally say 1970 is when mm -hmm. that revolutionary energy gets dissipated. Um, Brian Meeks also mentioned attention to Angola, but some people would say no, but it was, it was Algeria and the Congo was when that African moment of revolution happened. So I was just wondering how we situate the Jamaican 1970s in relation to this broader context to which it seems to be constantly referring, but with which it seems to have a kind of disjuncture. Um, I were specifically looking at connections with Cuba, the Cuban the, re the relation, the romance with Cuba is quite late. The 1970s are already generally a period of disillusionment in certain parts of Latin America and, and Western Europe. Um, and uh, yeah, so how does the Jamaican case fit into or challenge these broader historical narratives? And is this even a question that I, is worth trying to answer? I think that there is a, I'm, I'm jumping for a long, long person. Because I think this is a, it's a really interesting question, partly a historiographical question, um, about whether the 60s ends in 72, <laughs> or the 70s begins in 68, right? Yeah. And I think in many, many ways in, in, in Jamaican cultural political history, the period between 68 and 72 
is a fascinating period of upsurge of various kinds of directions that begin to solidify or appear to solidify from the 1970s onwards. So I mean, I think that there, there is a, a kind of interesting blurring between 1968, or it can be, the story can be written that way. I mean, it, it's a, I've often thought, um, if you take texts like um, Rex's Mirror, Mirror, what is Mirror, Mirror's written? If, if you remember the postscript to Mirror, Mirror, Rex knows that something is on the horizon, but which he cannot name, right? I mean, 69 has happened, Michael Manley has, is, um, has taken over the, the PNP. Norman is dead. So in some sense, that entire era is over, right? But the, Rex can't quite name what, what the decade of the 70s is going to be. But he is certain that the 60s is over because he names the period the 60s. It is over as a period for him. That's one. Another interesting text to think about is George Beckford's Persistent Poverty, which is 1972. And whether Beckford's um, Persistent Poverty is the most articulate uh, um, formulation of a 1960s project around plantation society here, right? Or is Persistent Poverty a kind of a staging of a theorization that comes to be crucial in the 1970s? So there are, I think that these are important um, hinged texts. And I think in some sense that period 1968 to 72 is a kind of hinge period in Jamaican cultural history. Sorry. I, I, no, 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 no. I'd like, I, I, yes. I, I just like to comment on this sort of international perspective a little mm. bit because I think that there's, there's a real way, yes, that 68 is, is it, you know, in Mexico the students are massacred in Prague and French things shut down. Uh, but from a Caribbean perspective, 68 is a big deal. Um, 68. From an Anglo Caribbean from, a, from an Anglo Caribbean yeah, yeah, perspective, yeah, yeah. and, and I, I accept that important correction. It's a beginning. Um, it's it's 68 in Jamaica. It's 70 in Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. It's a Rat Island meeting in 70, 70. 70. in 70 itself, um, which is when all the Caribbean uh, radical movement re recognizes itself. It's 72 with Manu's election in Jamaica. 73. Uh, in, se in 73 in Grenada, there is, there is a first uh, moment uh, of the, sh the, the, the entire shutdown of the country around the independence period, which lays the basis for 79. And then there's 79 in Grenada. And it's so, so certainly in the US. And, and, and yeah. Which opens things to yes. for, for Jamaica. Absolutely. Um, and what, the, what the Carter thing does is, 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 is an opening, but before Carter, is the withdrawal from Vietnam, um, the Nixon um, um, debacle, um, and what that does is open up a sort of hegemonic space um, which allows Carter to come in and a different kind of policy which opens up possibilities. So certainly from an Anglo-Caribbean perspective, we can draw a narrative that, that there is, you know, culturally, 68 is a year in which reggae comes out and steps up the pace of Jamaican music in terms of its message. 69 is everything crash, right? Which is, which is a sort of emblematic song ending the decade. Everything crash, uh, metaphorically as well as actually. Um, uh, and um, in 69, Bob Marley comes out with Babylon Burning, right? Uh, so so there's, there's reggae steps up the cultural pace in keeping with this. Internationally, uh, the, the, the end of the Vietnam War, the way it ends, is critically important. Uh, and, 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 and the sort of twist in that thing is I ended in Chile in 73, in September 11, 73. But, but even that defeat, in a way, sets the pace for how the Caribbean left looks at the world. Right? And then in 74 is Angola. So, so there, there, there's a sort of, 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 of way in which there is a different set of things happening. Mm -hmm. I think I one other figure that we haven't talked about is Carl Stone. Else, right? yeah. and, I'm, and Carl Stone is missing from his conversation. Yes. And, and, and his first book is 71, and he comes back with a very different view of 
the story of Jamaican political history than the left. His trade is connected to his connection to, to Archie Singham and the way in which Archie Singham is Stone's idea of political behaviorism and what can be counted as on. Stone is a figure that we have not so, um, mentioned yesterday or today and it should be. Yeah. Uh, Rupert and Obika, can you choose first? Yeah, whilst I understand the political narrative international and so on, but I'm at four and out the Jamaican economy by 73, 74. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all this free education and then could pay for it. Yeah. It's like the, the international connections are important, but the material foundation of the Jamaican economy was on a road to being crushed. But did you know that then, Rupert? We did to some degree, to some degree, which is why you had the Beckford plan and the WPJ hostility to it because of the, the working class. Because they had no plan for foreign exchange and you know, they can't live without foreign exchange. Right? That was the, the crux of one is the economist and this, uh, this, this, this aspect of it. So I want you, maybe we did not appreciate the severe erosion that was taking place in the foreign exchange project, which led to all the shortages phase and on, on top of it, which assumed a more significant impact in the day-to-day -day life of people uh, than, than we think. Emphasize the food thing. And I remember how significant this was for the day-to-day -day life of people and why the Beckford Lindsay plan could not work if it would have exacerbated that situation. So just to underscore that material. Yeah. Yeah, I've often taken the PNP to task for its uh, cultural and uh, class numbering by thinking of itself as more a party more schooled and more ideologically driven and its partisans than the GOP partisans um, when that is certainly only a partial truth because when we come to down to power plays both of them are using the same strategy of mass mobilization and manipulation and the rest. However, the PNP is distinctive for its uh, it's intellectual, educational, ideologically bookish culture at the time, and even drifting down through the trade union movement to the party, to, to the partisans. So the question that I have, since you raised it, the whole thing, I share the question of the distinctiveness of this rule, is what happens to the JLP in terms of it, the ideological struggle? Um, what kind of um, summoning other than guns and the mobilization of US power does the GLP offer at the, the ideological level okay. for its partisan and for its intellectuals? Who are the GLP intellectuals that come alongside the guns and the US mobilization? I think that is missing from our discussion. Well, it's, 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 uh, certainly would be one of the... Yeah. 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 But I think, um, I remember uh, Omar Davis saying to me once that he and Seattle were happy. But he was, Omar was a fan of and Eddie was in opposition. And uh, Eddie came to him and said, uh, I want, there's some issues I want to discuss with you. Uh, and Omar said to him, okay, I bring my team. And you bring your team. I had a service team. This is a one show team. Uh, there are umpteen stories of this type. Uh, when Larry Summers was in Jamaica with the MIT team working with Eddie, uh, we didn't write to him, and he was a postdoc or something like that. Uh, and uh, they were supposed to help to bring on the economy. Yeah, they used to demand a phone with all the data personally. 
those days before the email, that you can't just like a disket and so on and march up to the email account and give you every single piece of data that they collected. And of course, it went down after very quickly. One not sure. But very interesting point, though, that question you raised. So many things, so many things to say on issues at all. Uh, I think that it is the four. Tiago's position, and I think it's an intellectually coherent position, by the way, and I don't think it's totally cynical, no more cynical than my position, and my position. It's a version, it derives its intellectual antecedents are uh, Curtin and M.G. Smith. Right? And indeed, M.G. and Tiago read, I would say, in, um, I mean, if you probably come back from here, right? Yeah, but nonetheless, I would argue in substance, because the, the cultural pluralism and the two Jamaican thesis are really very, very practically identical. Uh, but uh, the difference was that then we saw the PNP should go to the PNP is the natural leader, whereas that was not Seattle's view. Seattle's coherent view. A coherent view turned to be disastrous. In the end. And the, the issue was this. And you know, we have to go back to the 50s and 60s, and a big factor in your issue is the colonial situation. You know, Jamaica the colony until 62 people wasn't and this created a skills of oil kind of delay to the political development of a lot of the issues that we were going back. And you go back to the 50s and 60s when basically what happened is that the PNP, after a difficult struggle, finally gained control of the city, political control. And a lot of the early political violence arose out of that struggle. This is in the, in the 40s, late 40s and the 50s. And the left led that struggle with Dick, uh, Ken Hill, and uh, Ark, and so on, um, Henry, and Frank, and so on, led that struggle, and succeeded in locking down Kingston and driving Boston Manti out here, defeated Clarendon and Perron, but kaput. Ken, Ken made sharp work out here. And in that context, the British used the police as an agent of conservatism, uh, the political violence, to counter the advance of the PNP. So the police were deployed by the force today in, in two British style. Um, Paris thought we'd never be working in such a right? But actually, they were extremely active on the intelligence of the military police side, the particular police number, which they know. And their role was to block the PNPs. Uh, group 69 forces, like in Manchester, from extending the PNP, but it, they were defeated. So the situation by 49, certainly, which is a prelude to exploit under 52, was that um, Kingston was locked down, it was entirely in control of the left, and the trade through the trade union movement. Now, this was typical of the, on the, on the working class. And in that context, the attempts of the, I thought the long struggle, forgive me, it will eventually make sense, but no, no, no. Um, the capitalist class, per se, and the landowners and so on, Bobby Kirkwood in particular, some of the uh, they formed their own political party in, in uh, 46 um, to make a democracy. Democrat, Democrat, and, Democrat. and this was interesting because they, they <coughs> this is connected to Seattle. They went forward and offered themselves to the electorate. Wiped out. Right. Wiped right. out. And they, at that point, they came to the political conclusion that they, it was not possible in a country like Jamaica for them to be directly involved in politics. They had to operate behind the scenes. And the strategy then was to go into the GLP. Right? And they developed this complicated relationship with Boston. So they operate in the corridors of Paul because they've been rejected in an open thing. So on. Now Siaga comes on the scene and the significance of Siaga, and Siaga by the way, and all this hypocrisy on Siaga of, of the elite, the spread from the man, I mean, what could he have in blood, you see? Siaga was financed right, by all the big business management. But there's, they, are, they are as compromised in garrison politics. And this nonsense about gangs are gone, and how it's all about it's out and so on. Uh, they found this darn gas, right? Could not exist in the I mean, West Kingston Trust, all of these things. They poured money into it, right? Seattle was the made a breakthrough. This is the significant political significance of Seattle. Into the urban area. 
And Siaga established that, in fact, it wasn't true that a white or light-skinned person couldn't directly enter. He, this was the significance of it, that you could do it, it could be done, and he did it. But you had to use force. You had to be pretty ruthless to do it. And above all, you had to build it on social form, on a different social basis. You had to build it on the law You could build it on the trade union. The trade union was locked down by the PNP on the one hand and the AIQ on the other hand. So there was no path like that. The only path was the long pen groups unemployed, huge unemployed groups of people, and on the ideological level, to develop an ideological and cultural alternative uh, 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 embodiment or expression of Jamaican culture which could compete with what was being offered by the left and the naturalists, and that was a folk culture, and it was capo and that complex. So it's now coherent view that that if you if you develop this complex, right, uh, and you have to convince the upper parts of the society, you are very colonial, very backward and so on, that it is in their interest, right, to go along with this sort of garbage or garbage in project. Uh, which I'm, I'm not presenting this as insincerity, but as a coherent view, uh, because the only way to, this is actually an in your enlightened self-interest, the only way you can maintain your position, you can't maintain your position in society on the old colonial basis, it can't be done, it's, it's not viable, right? It's going to foment dissent, it's going to exacerbate the two Jamaicas, you're going to be kicked, in, kicked out. The only way to keep your position and I, this is the point. The inspiration behind this is for the elite to keep its position. Is for you to open up a space for a certain kind of blackening, a certain kind of national hero. And you, you, if you can appropriate that, uh, you will be able to maintain your position in spite of the inherent instability of this two. You may know this is a very coherent position. Right? It, uh, and and the wood cuffs, which has enormous on building your political pulse on the sand of the long term, has extremely serious, which going back to bite in the end. Right? He didn't think that it would, but it certainly gave him a good solid bite. Right? Uh, but this was the view, and this was the approach. Right? And, and the all fundamental point of fundamentalism is that this and it's the MG, and this is the MG thing I'm doing. Culture. You can talk cultural pluralism to the blue face. Right? You can talk two Jamaica, like ten Jamaica. I don't you, you multiply it any number you want. Right? Uh, but yet when changes our goal is not to have a moderate alteration of the status quo in order to, in the JP model, maintain the position of the old elite. Or in the PNP model, to replace the old elite by a sort of upcoming brown elite. Whatever. Our goal is to tear down both elites. That's our goal. Right? And therefore, uh, we don't, we're not into this cultural games that you and Eddie have, right? which are competing elites. All, all position, and of course I was then stating it in a most favorable terms from my point of view, uh, all position is that, uh, therefore, there's an underpinning to this two Jamaica structures, which you don't want to talk about. Right? And that is the economy and the political order, and of course external forces. And you can bob and weave, and you can have as much capital, and you can have as much revival field as you want. <laughs> <laughs> These are, at the end of the day, right, the structures of power remain in place. And it's, it's at, at a deep level, political hypocrisy and social hypocrisy, uh, unless you can remove those structures. So that was this, that's how I understand it. That was the situation. So I agree. It's a career, it's got even view, very career view. Right? Mm -hmm. I just want to We are going to ask you yeah, to sure. produce a paper. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's actually recorded, so we'll use it. But I just want to have I, Deborah. I just want to insist on this point. Yes, yes, a, yes. A yes I'm yes, on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Deb, and then. Um, and, and you? Yeah, and then Don it. And we will. Um, and then, Okay. It it's, 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 it's a very um, short and small thing, but a point of interest, I think, about the external forces. 
So the position of the U.S. Um, as the leadership is changing in both the PNP and the GLP, or at the end of the 60s, uh, both officially from the foreign relations files, but also unofficially to the CIA, is actually, and this goes to Obika's point, is that the GLP does not have an ideology. It's the PNP that we worry about because of the ideology that it started with and the way that it will be developing and how Manly is positioned in relation to different people. But Siaga, they saw as an upstart, um, someone with ambition to be prime minister if he's not assassinated first. This is what it's, is written. And, um, and in, in the conversations with whomever they're having conversations with, on this, uh, uh, sorry, on that side of things, is that um, he probably has ambition to be prime minister one day, but doesn't feel it would be possible for a white man to be the prime minister of that country. Which obviously changes. The, the final thing on is that he's not nearly broad. This is a huge mischaracterization. Mm -hmm. He is a state. The state is absolute yeah. rock solid. Yeah. State. And that's why he fell yeah. over yeah. the back in the army yeah. and the war on in the in the fresh revolution in eighty five. Yeah. And this is why he fell over with uh, Rockefeller and the US tried. And this is what Michael got into power, got back into power. Through Maya and Larry Eagleberg and Father Bush, because Maya mm -hmm. yes, uh, yes, yes. Um, um, so I'll condense it. So one of the things that this convening has made clear is that there are multiple narratives about the social formation of the 1970s. Even in this room, it's being contested in the moment of the 70s and how we remember it. But I have a question about um, archives and authority. Because um, in Rupert's paper, when you, or even in the conversations you've been having over the last couple of days, you've pointed to at different moments people who have intervened in the conversation, but they, and wrote pieces that are published, but they're nameless. So if we return to that archive, socialism, the journals, how do we, like, how do we know who, so there's something there that's lost to the historical record if we don't have someone like you saying, you know, this was this person, this was I mean, this was so what do we what do we make of that archive when we don't have authorship attributed to it? Where we find out from those who know the authors. Okay. Right, right. But the point is, but the point is right, right, no, but what I'm saying is we have to do it. But the point is we have to do it now, right? Because if we don't, that gets lost. Absolutely. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. I'll just tell you. So the question is partly my laziness because I haven't read all the genes. <laughs> but I'm, I'm wondering what is it about that piece of fiction that has made it an historical text, a piece of historical fiction that actually changes how you think of it. Yeah. It seems as though you can't write about the 70s without reading that. Well, I don't yeah. know about that. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it's, 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 it's not the same. Well, well what's the interesting, time. right, is that <laughs> in the 60s convening, yeah. I was slightly annoyed that Marlon took up so much space, so that before we could get to the 70s, yeah. he hovered <laughs> in the 60s. Wait, wait, no, 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 let me just finish. But today, but, but over the last couple of days, our conversations about the 70s was about 70s texts, whether they were in the moment of the 70s or other takes of the 70s, so that Marlon doesn't become the omniscient, you know, the, the, the sole voice, and my, my issue with that reading, which I think is a potential way of reading Marlin's, that like we can't come through the 70s unless we come through him, is that it limits how we construct the 70s, right? right? Um, because he's coming at it from a, from, partic from a particular location and positionality, which is not to say that there's a critique of that, 
but I'm against any one canonization of any text, right? I need to have the multiplicity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we will um, allow Donet the last word. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. participants in this conversation. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.